For the first, oh, 25 years or so of its history, Star Trek provided us with no shortage of heroes. And while they were memorable heroes, likable heroes, admirable heroes, they weren't overly complex heroes. I'm not saying they were bad characters or totally flat characters. They occasionally showed some depth. Spock's struggles as a biracial and bicultural person, and Kirk's loss of his son, temporary loss of Spock, and acknowledging and trying to move beyond his prejudice against Klingons come to mind, as do Picard's traumatic abduction by the Borg and its aftermath, and Data's recurring quest to have his personhood recognized and explore his own humanity. But those and a few other examples aside, the crews of Classic Trek and Next Gen are a pretty straightforward bunch. I love them, but what you see is more or less what you get. When the time came to develop another Trek series to follow the next generation, however, the creators of that show decided to make up for lost time and delivered a cast populated by practically nothing but complex characters. I'm not shy about the fact that Star Trek Deep Space Nine is my favorite Star Trek series. One of the reasons why I love it so much is that amazing cast of characters. And there is one character in particular who stands out even among that group as the show's most complex and most complicated hero. As you probably guessed, that character is the subject of this video because the title of this video is... Why Major Kira is actually Deep Space Nine's most complicated hero. Major Kira Norris, Colonel Kira Norris in the show's final season, is the first officer of Space Station Deep Space Nine, second in command to Commander, later Captain Ben Sisko. We meet her in the show's premiere episode, and right away we get the impression that Kira is complex and complicated. I use both of those terms because I think they both apply. Kira is complex in the sense that she has layers to her character that are developed and revealed as the series progresses, layers that contain brutal experiences, difficult choices, suffering, and survival. And Kira is complicated because, as we find out throughout the series, even though she's unquestionably one of the good guys, she's done a lot of bad things in her life, and she still carries around a lot of anger and a lot of opinions that are... Let's call them atypical for a Star Trek protagonist. In the interest of shedding some light on Kira's complex and complicated nature, and also in the interest of being thorough but not having this take all goddamn day, I've selected five episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine through which we can chart the development and revelation of Kira's character. The first takes place in the latter half of DS9's first season and allows us to see how difficult it is for Kira after spending most of her life as a resistance fighter, to adjust to her new role as an officer in an organized military and an administrator. The episode is called Progress. Bajor, still recovering from the damage caused by decades of Cardassian occupation, is preparing to tap a new energy source, the molten core of one of its moons. With the project about to get underway, Kira and Dax take a runabout to the moon for an inspection. Along the way, Dax casually mentions that she finds Morn, you know, the chatty guy at Quark's bar, cute. And not cute in an oh-what-a-cute-puppy sort of way, cute in a I'd-be-open-to-touching-each-other's-junk sort of way. Kira has no time to process the existential horror of that before the runabout sensors detect the presence of people on an area of the moon's surface where there ain't supposed to be no people. Kira beams down and finds a quaint little cottage, a woman with a pitchfork, and a man working an alien hoe, the gardening implement. To be clear, what he does when he's off camera is none of my business. The gardeners menace Kira with their tools, but then out steps Judge Hardcase Hardcastle. I guess he finally retired to Bajor. Good for him. I heard McCormick moved out to the Briar Patch. Actually, this is Mullabach, and he lives here with his two old friends, Kina and Baltram. He's the one with the hoe. They fled here from Bajor during the occupation. Mullabach has been here 40 years, ever since he escaped from a Cardassian labor camp. And, as he explains to Kira, at length, during the preparation and consuming of supper, he tamed this wild land himself. His home is here, and he doesn't care what that highfalutin Bajoran provisional government says about some newfangled energy source. He's not moving. 
Kira's like, oh, I get it. You did some legitimately badass shit when you were young and you just expected to live off of that for the rest of your life. Well, you almost made it, but now we're going to need the moon to, you know, provide energy to heat the homes of hundreds of thousands of people on Bajor, so pack your shit. Mullabach refuses to leave. This puts Kira in quite the ethical conundrum. The energy extraction process will render the moon uninhabitable. If Mullabach and the others don't leave, they'll die. Mullabach knows this and still says he's not going anywhere. Kira returns to Deep Space Nine and discusses the situation with Commander Sisko and Turan, the Bajaran official in charge of the energy project. Kira's like, I don't know what to do here. Maybe if we postponed the start of the energy extraction, I could talk him into something? Turan's not hearing that. We're not postponing, okay? There were a bunch of other people living on that moon too, and they all left when they got notice. These three are the only holdouts, and I'm not going to let them stand in the way of something that will be a major benefit to our entire planet. So what should I do? Well, I've heard of this thing that you might be able to try called making him leave. This is Star Trek. We have transporters. Just beam them up. Mm, he kept saying stuff like, if I leave here, I'll die. I don't think just beaming him up out of nowhere is a good idea. Okay, then. Go back there with some security officers and order him to leave. I'm not comfortable with that either. Look, we've been more than patient. Time's up. Now get some cops and go drag that elderly Holocaust survivor out of his home. Kira doesn't go that far, but she does go back to Mullabach's place with some Bajaran cops. While they go off to collect Baltram and Kina, Kira tries again to convince Mullabach to leave. He tries to distract her with one of his long, pointless old man stories, but then the cops come back with Beltram and Kina in custody, and one of the cops is like, He came at me with his hoe! Furious to see his friends being manhandled, Mullabach attacks one of the cops and gets shot for his trouble. Kira orders the cops to take Baltram and Kina to the runabout and call for Dr. Bashir. Bashir arrives, treats Mullabak, but tells him his injury is serious enough that he shouldn't move for a few days. He still refuses to leave, so Kira volunteers to stay and watch over him while he recovers. Bashir is like, actually, he's going to need real medical care, so I'm just going to beam the stubborn old bastard up whether he likes it or not. But Kira forbids it, tells Bashir to just leave behind whatever medical supply she'll need, and she'll take care of him. So Bashir leaves. And Kira stays and begins working on finishing this stone barbecue grill that Mullabach has been building. Some time passes. Kira nurses Mullabach and bickers with him and works on his grill. Commander Sisko stops by for a visit and says to Kira, you know, this really shouldn't be taking this long. He should have been out of here by now. Kira says, it's not that simple. And Sisko replies, I didn't say it was simple. I said you need to get his ass out of here. Bajor is turning this moon into an energy source whether he likes it or not. Stop acting like he has a choice here. He doesn't. I know you're used to fighting for the underdog, but you're not the underdog anymore. Kira really doesn't like how that feels. She compares the Bajaran government forcing Mullabak out of his home to the kinds of tactics Cardassians used to employ against Bajarans. She's not comfortable with any of this, but she has to face reality. This is happening. So, finally... Kira wakes up one morning to find Mullabach up and about, feeling better. He's outside, putting the finishing touches on his barbecue, in fact. Once it's done, he lights it up for the first time. Kira goes inside, comes back out with a duffel bag and a bedroll, pulls her phaser, and barbecues Mullabach's barbecue. Then, to emphasize her point, she barbecues his house, too. Mullabach's like, this farm, this house, it's who I am, and you're just gonna stand there and watch me burn? Well, that's all right, because I like the way it hurts. Kira says, I like you a lot, and the time I spent here with you is important, but now we both have to move on. I know you think you'll die if you leave here, but I won't let you. Just gonna stand there and hear me cry, eh? That's all right, because I love the way you lie. I love the way you lie. I can't tell you what it really is. I can only tell you what it feels like. And it feels like Kira doesn't like her job. She's a former resistance fighter, a lifelong rebel. She often exhibits discomfort with her duties as DS9's first officer and the liaison between the Bajaran militia and Starfleet, and she frequently displays an extremely cynical attitude toward the Bajaran government in general. Yet, she stays in her job and does the best she can because, despite her doubts, she believes in the larger goal of rebuilding Bajor following the occupation, thinks the Bajaran provisional government, in cooperation with Starfleet, is in the best position to carry out that rebuilding, 
and she wants to help. Helping isn't always easy, though. One of the things that makes progress a good episode, and a good Kira episode specifically, is that Kira doesn't escape having to make the difficult choice. There is no third option for her to discover at the last minute. There is no compromise that allows Mullabach to stay, or even to leave on his own terms. Unlike Captain Picard in the TNG episode Journey's End, where a community of descendants of Native Americans avoids being forcibly relocated by agreeing to live under Cardassian authority after the Federation gives away their planet as part of a peace treaty, Kira isn't able to preserve her conscience in resolving the situation with Mullabach. Of course, the ending of Journey's End also led to the creation of the Maquis when the Cardassians turned out to be shitty landlords, but that's neither here nor there. Kira's transition from someone who fought against authority to someone responsible for wielding that authority is difficult and uncomfortable, but her experience fighting to free her world from the occupation left her with other, more personal struggles as well. For example, she's not super fond of Cardassians. The creators of Deep Space Nine explore this facet of Kira's character in another first season episode, Duet. A Cardassian man with a rare illness arrives on the station. Kira takes one look at him and goes, Arrest that war criminal! See, the rare illness this guy has was caused by an accident at a Cardassian labor camp. If he was at that labor camp, and he's a Cardassian, that means he was one of the people who ran the labor camp, which means he's a war criminal, because even having forced labor camps at all is a war crime in and of itself, and this particular camp, Galatep, was especially horrific. Mass starvation, flagrant sexual assault, beatings, murders. Except this Cardassian guy, who says his name is Maritza, insists he had nothing to do with all that. He was never at Galatep or any other labor camp, and he doesn't have that rare illness Kira says he has. He has this other, extremely similar, but legally and morally distinct illness. Kira doesn't take Maritza at his word, however. She has Dr. Bashir confirm that he does have the Galatep disease, not the other, less incriminating one. She confronts Maritza with this, and he admits that yes, okay, he was at Galatep, but he was merely a humble filing clerk. He had nothing to do with any of the atrocities they were doing. In fact, there were no atrocities at all. Sure, conditions were rough, but most of those horror stories were invented and spread by the Cardassians, primarily the officer in charge of the camp, the brilliant and handsome Guldar Heel, as a propaganda tool to terrify the Bajorans. Since she was actually there at Galatep when it was liberated, Kira knows this we made up the atrocities story is bullshit. She continues checking into Maritza and discovers a photograph in the Bajaran archives that shows this Maritza guy at Galatep. Only the person in the photo identified as Maritza looks nothing like the guy in the holding cell. There is this other guy in the photo who looks exactly like the guy in the holding cell, but according to the caption attached to the photo, that guy is Guldar Heel. Kira goes back to the holding cell like, aha, gotcha, space Gert. Gert, like the writer? No, that's Goethe. I'm referring to Gert, the commandant of the infamous Plashow concentration camp during Earth's Second World War. Seems like kind of an out of left field reference for one of us to make either way, but whatever. Don't try to change the subject, Guldar Heel. You've escaped justice this long, but now your ass is mine. And the guy in the cell is like, yep, you got me. I'm Guldar Heel. I did all the war crimes, and I loved it, because I hate Bajarans. And you know what? I wish I'd killed even more Bajarans than I did. If I could, I'd be killing Bajarans right now. But that has sadly fallen out of fashion of late. Even so, I'm proud of my accomplishments in the area of Bajarans killing. I accomplished a lot more than you and your piddly little Shikar resistance cell, that's for damn sure. When Kira steps out for a glass of berry blue Kool-Aid, Odo points out that it's strange for a labor camp commander to know that Kira was a member of a specific resistance cell. Kira goes back in and says, hey, how did you know what resistance cell I was a member of? And Darheel says, I knew thanks to the filing system of Maritza, my brilliant and handsome clerk. Darheel asks Kira how many Cardassians she killed as a member of the resistance, and she says, I don't know, a whole bunch. I did a lot of things back then I regret, but you invaded our world. We were fighting for survival. 
Darheel says, We Cardassians were fighting for survival, too. We needed your resources to strengthen our empire. Everything I did was justified because it was for the glory of Cardassia. Kira says, Nothing justifies genocide. Really? Not even if a small number of the people you're genociding are terrorists who attacked a musical festival, killed over a thousand civilians, and took hundreds of hostages? No, even then, genocide is not okay. But Cardassia has a right to defend itself! What? Nothing. The point is, you suck and I have no guilt. Odo pulls Kira aside to share with her some interesting information he's learned. The guy in the cell is not Guldar Heel after all. Guldar Heel is dead. Like, super dead. He had a massive public funeral, and he's buried under a gigantic monument that Gul Dukat is clearly very jealous of. That man in the cell is Maritza, after all. His medical records indicate he underwent cosmetic surgery around five years ago, and that when he left his home planet, he specifically booked passage on a ship that was scheduled to stop here. Kind of weird for a supposed Cardassian war criminal to want to visit a Bajaran space station. Unless he wanted to get caught. So, armed with this information, Kira goes at the guy in the cell one last time. She says, Okay, so it turns out you're Maritza after all, and you've just been pretending to be Goldar Heel. Nah, I am Goldar Heel, war criminal, Bajaran hating scumbag, that's me. Nah, you're Maritza though. Am not, am not, am not. I'm making fun of it because of what a terrible person I am, but in the episode, this is actually a very heavy and very moving moment. What's happened is this guy, Maritza, has assumed the identity of one of the most infamous war criminals from the occupation and intentionally gotten himself arrested so that the Bajaran authorities can execute him for his crimes and by punishing him, symbolically punish all of Cardassia. Maritza was there at the Galatep camp. He was a filing clerk. He didn't directly participate in the atrocities, but he knew they were happening and he did nothing. Cardassia has to acknowledge its guilt he tells Kira through tears. And we're guilty. All of us. Kira's disgust and anger toward this man have turned to pity. She releases him from the holding cell. As she escorts him through the promenade, she tells him that what he tried to do was honorable, and that Cardassia will need honorable people like him if the kind of change he wants is ever going to happen. As they walk, a Bajaran guy, who we saw get arrested earlier in the episode, comes behind Maritza and stabs him in the back, killing him. Kira yells, why did you do it? He wasn't Goldar Heel. The Bajaran guy says, he's a Cardassian. That's reason enough. And Kira yells back, no, it's not. Though she will continue to grapple with her feelings toward the Cardassian people as a whole for the rest of the series, Kira's ability to ultimately sympathize with Maritza and admire his motive, if not his method, as well as her refusal to blame the occupation on all Cardassians everywhere, shows that she has the potential to see beyond her own experiences and to outgrow her prejudices. Her feelings toward Cardassians are, like so much of her character, complicated, which is understandable given her background. Speaking of Kira's background, we learn a bit more about that in the next episode I want to look at, a show from DS9's second season called Necessary Evil. Unlike the other episodes I'm focusing on, Necessary Evil isn't really a Kira episode. It's an Odo episode. But Kira's supporting role is crucial to the story, and the revelations about Kira and her activities in the years prior to the start of the series are of great significance to her character. Much of the episode takes place five years in the past, when the Cardassians still controlled the station, and Odo was just some shape-shifting guy who lived there, who was tasked by Gul Dukat with investigating the murder of a Bajaran chemist. Kira was on the station back then, too, and fell under suspicion for the murder. It's how she and Odo first crossed paths, actually. Every couple has their meet-cute story. Five years ago, Odo was unable to solve the murder of the chemist, but after a near-fatal attack on Quark compels him to reopen the case, present-day Odo finally identifies the killer. And it's Kira. The chemist, it turns out, was a collaborator with the Cardassians, and he had a list of other collaborators hidden in his shop. Kira was sent to Deep Space Nine by the Bajaran Resistance to find the list so they would know who was stooging them off to the Cardassians. Kira was in the chemist's shop searching for the list when the chemist discovered her, so she killed him. Odo's cool with it, though, so no worries. He seems more upset with Kira over the fact that she lied to him about it. The killing itself? NBD. 
It wasn't cold-blooded murder. Kira wasn't there to kill the guy. She was there to find a list of collaborators, but it wasn't self-defense either. Kira doesn't tell Odo that the chemist attacked her, just that he walked in on her. She killed him to protect the secret of why she was on the station and her identity as a member of the resistance. He was a collaborator with a fascist dictatorship that was occupying her planet, and she was part of a group fighting against those fascists, so it seems like justifiable homicide to me. I don't know if it would qualify as that in a legal sense, but morally? Yeah, that's what I'd call it. Be that as it may, it still establishes Kira as a hero who did a murder. This is a drastic departure for Star Trek, and even for Deep Space Nine at this point. The DS9 crew are an ethically dubious bunch by Trek standards, but to the best of my recollection, Kira's the only one with a someone caught me burglarizing their place of business for a good reason, so I killed them story. The way it's presented, we're clearly meant to be on Kira's side with the whole thing, but we're also not afforded the luxury of completely dismissing the wrongness of what she did. She was acting in service of a larger purpose that was noble, defending Bajor from Cardassians and the Bajaran traders who were helping them, but she still killed someone that, strictly speaking, she didn't have to kill. Spock never did that. Riker never did that. Kira did. And the series asks us to take that in and still accept her as one of the good guys. You might say to yourself, well, that's not such a challenge. And sure, maybe killing a chemist collaborator can't quell your compassion for Kira, but consider, what if that wasn't the only time she did something like that? What if she did something even worse? It's implied several times, referred to vaguely, she was a resistance fighter, she was, as she calls herself on multiple occasions, a terrorist, and she did some things that she now regrets, things she had to do, but things which were unpleasant nevertheless. In its fifth season, Deep Space Nine asks us once again to confront one of the ugly bits from Kira's past and ask ourselves if we still consider her a hero, and this time they really don't make it easy. It happens in an episode titled The Darkness and the Light. It's the Bajaran Days of Atonement, and we see a group of monks praying in a cave, and then one of them gets shot to death by a lamp. This is the first time we're seeing this particular Bajaran religious observance, so I can't be sure, but I don't think that's typical. On Deep Space Nine, Major Kira, who at this point in the series is pregnant with Chief O'Brien's baby, not like that. It's because of some Star Trek shit, remember? Anyway, she receives a message. It's a picture of the monk who was just killed by the lamp, with a scary voice saying, that's one, over and over again. It turns out the dead monk, Latha, was a member of the Shakar resistance cell with Kira back during the occupation. Kira worries that someone with an axe to grind is picking off her old comrades. That worry turns out to be well-founded. Another old friend of Kira's, Fala, is killed when the transporter is sabotaged as she's trying to beam up to catch a ride from Worf and Dax. And a third, Mobara, is also killed before too much longer. Two more veterans of Kira's resistance self, Forel and Lupaza, arrive on the station determined to protect Kira from whoever is picking off their friends. That turns out to be a poor decision for them. Forel and Lupaza stay in the O'Brien's quarters with Kira, and they are killed when an explosion blasts out a window and they're blown into space. The investigation into these killings is going nowhere. Odo promises Kira he'll find the person responsible, but that's not good enough. Kira takes matters into her own hands. Odo's investigation does come up with three suspects. After eliminating two of them, Kira takes a runabout to the home of the third, a Cardassian named Solarin Prin, living on a planet near the Federation Cardassian demilitarized zone. Kira arrives at Solarin's place and is quickly knocked unconscious. She awakens to find herself fastened to a chair in a dark room. Her captor, Solarin, who seems a bit unbalanced, explains that the killings of Kira's old friends are actually her fault because they were all part of a resistance operation back during the occupation that assassinated a Cardassian military leader by planting an explosive outside his bedroom window. Because Kira actually set the charge, she's the last to die. Kira is unrepentant for the killing of the Cardassian military leader, Gul Parak. He was not only the commander of a weapons depot that was supplying soldiers during the occupation, he was also responsible for the execution of 15 Bajarans whose only crime was refusing to fly the Cardassian flag. So Kira's like, yeah, we killed him, to hell with that guy. 
But Solarin says, what about the innocents who were also harmed in that attack? The bomb didn't just kill Gold Parak, it killed his entire family. It killed 12 Cardassians in all, and it injured 23 others, including Solarin himself, who still bears the scars from that day. And, Solarin says, I wasn't part of your war. I wasn't in the military. I was just a civilian doing my job. I was a servant in Gul Parak's household. That's all. Kira says, you know what, dude? Your boss was a mass murderer who worked for mass murderers. Fifteen million Bajarans were killed during the occupation. None of you should have been there. You were invaders who took our land and starved us and raped us and killed us, and none of us in the resistance enjoyed killing, but we were doing what we had to do to get rid of you, and you were all legitimate targets, whether you were in the military or not. So you can just turn this guilt trip around and drive it straight up your own ass. Solarin says, see, that's what makes me better than you. I only killed the guilty. I could have blown up your entire space station and killed everyone on it, but my attacks were targeted, focused, precise. I only killed who I wanted to kill, and now I'm going to kill you. But don't worry, I'm going to save the baby you're carrying, because the baby, unlike you, is innocent. Kira says, can you put me to sleep before you cut the baby out, because that's liable to hurt a tad. Solarin agrees and gives Kira a sedative, but little does he know that the sedative won't work because Kira's been taking Bajaran herbs as health supplements during her pregnancy, and the herbs counteract the sedative. Ha ha! As Solarin is moving in for the kill, Kira snaps to, grabs a phaser, and kills him. Take that, maimed, traumatized terrorism survivor, who is also a multiple murderer. One of the things that makes The Darkness and the Light a great episode, and specifically a great Kira episode, is the way it's able to present the villain, Solarin, as sympathetic without resorting to bland, dull both sidesism. Solarin's history is tragic. He was collateral damage in a terrorist attack. He's been terribly scarred. He's obviously been seriously affected mentally and emotionally by what happened. And even though he is a calculated, cold blooded murderer, he does kind of have a point when he draws a distinction between his actions and those of Kira and the Resistance Cell back in the day. They wanted to kill Gul Parak, so they blew up his house and everyone in it. Solarin wanted revenge against the people who did that, so he killed them, and only them, in ways that didn't result in collateral damage. It doesn't put Kira in the best light, does it? But you also have to consider Kira's side of things. Yes, the Bajaran resistance did use terrorism against the Cardassians. Kira describes herself as a terrorist. And yes, those acts of terrorism did sometimes kill people other than the intended targets. But hey, if the Cardassians weren't invading Bajor, none of them would have been killed by Bajaran terrorists, would they? The Bajarans were an occupied people, and yes, that occupation was carried out by the Cardassian military, but there were also civilians present like Solarin who worked to support that occupation. An underground resistance cell fighting a military occupation probably didn't have the resources or the time to plan and carry out precision strikes using state-of-the-art weapons like the ones Solarin used to commit his killings. Planting a bomb outside Gul Parak's window was their best shot at taking him out. Did they know the bomb would also kill his family and other people in his household? Yeah, probably. But this guy was a high-ranking officer in charge of a weapons depot who had also murdered Bajarans for not flying a flag. So the resistance did some ethical calculus and concluded that the downside of blowing up Gul Parak's house, the killing and maiming of people other than Parak, was outweighed by the upside, blowing up Gul Parak. And they decided to blow up Gul Parak's house. But just because it's justifiable under the circumstances doesn't mean it's a pure, good, noble thing. One of the recurring themes of Deep Space Nine as a series, especially in its later seasons, is the idea that in times of crisis and war, doing the pure, good, noble thing isn't always an option. Sometimes you find yourself in an extreme situation, and the only options available to you are ones that will require you to do something you'll regret. There are moments in life that don't allow for perfect heroes. Kira is perhaps the most complete and most challenging example of that. She isn't proud of being a terrorist during the occupation, but she doesn't say, I wish I hadn't done those things either, because from where she stands, she never had a choice. 
Her world was being hollowed out. Her people were being exploited and murdered, and she fought back however she could. If that meant that sometimes innocent or relatively innocent people got caught in the crossfire, so be it. The Bajarans didn't start the fight. They were just trying to win it. Having a second lead who used to be a terrorist doesn't mean Deep Space Nine is a pro-terrorism show. If anything, it's more ardently anti-terrorism than most other TV shows of its time. But it doesn't always seem like that because it refuses to present the morality of terrorism in simple black and white terms. In the episode Defiant, when Maquis member Thomas Riker steals the Defiant and flies it off on a mission to destroy what he believes to be a secret Cardassian base, Kira, who finds herself along for the ride, chastises Tom for trying to be a hero while engaging in an act of terrorism. Do you know what I would have done during the occupation if I'd had a ship like the Defiant at my command, Kira says to Tom? I would have used it to murder every fucking Cardassian I could find. I would have attacked and attacked and attacked until they either killed me or begged for peace because I was a terrorist and that's what terrorists do. She doesn't tell him that to try and sell him on terrorism or to make it sound like an awesome thing to do. She tells him that in an attempt to get through his head that the rules of the game aren't what he thinks they are. He's part of the Maquis, and the Maquis are terrorists, and terrorists aren't heroes. Even if their cause is just, even if their targets are worse than they are. In other words, it's complicated. Which is not to say Kira doesn't hold some straightforward black and white beliefs of her own. One of those, a big one, one that led to her killing that chemist in Necessary Evil, is fuck collaborators. And that one seems fair, doesn't it? If you're a member of a group that's being brutally oppressed, and you find out some members of your group are working with your oppressors, they're bad guys, right? Not very challenging ethical calculus there. That's what Kira thinks. Until the events of the last episode I'm going to examine, from Season 6 of DS9, a show titled Wrongs Darker Than Death or Night. It's Kira's mother's birthday. Kira doesn't remember her mother, who died when she was very young, but she marks the occasion anyway by purchasing her mother's favorite kind of flowers. Dax tells Kira, I bet your mom would be proud of you if she were here. And Kira says, I hope so. I'm proud of her. My father always said she was the bravest woman he ever knew. That evening, Kira is woken up by a call from an unidentified number. I never answer those, but I guess maybe telemarketers aren't a thing anymore in Star Trek's utopian future, so she doesn't know any better, and answers the call. It's Dukat! He says, hey, happy your mom's birthday. And while we're on that subject, I'm actually calling you now in the middle of the night to let you know that I used to fuck your mom. A lot. When she was alive, to be clear. Anyway, just thought you'd want to know. Bye. Kira doesn't like the sound of that I used to fuck your mom a lot business. Fortunately, she lives in a Star Trek show, and there's this thing called the Orb of Time down on Bajor that she can use to travel to the past and find out if Dukat is full of shit or if he was actually slipping his trouser snake to her mom on the regular. So that's what Kira does. The orb sends her back to the time of the occupation, back to the refugee center where she and her parents lived when she was very young. Right away, she encounters her father, Taban, her mother, Maru, and herself as a child. Kira gives them a fake name, and she's like, Hi, people I've never met before. Good to meet you. Because I am meeting you for the first time. Right now. A Bajaran guy, a collaborator, walks in with a Cardassian and says, Hey, you bunch of refugee scum, good news! That space station that's the main setting of this series, well, they're almost done building it because this is the past, and the troops there are gonna need some comfort women, so Kira's mom, drop that baby because you just won the lottery, and Kira, you're coming too because you're the POV character. Maru bids an anguished goodbye to her family, and she and Kira are taken to space station Terok Nor, the future Deep Space Nine. And they get to be roomies! Oh, how fun! At least, that's Maru's attitude. While Kira's all about maintaining their resolve in the face of their Cardassian oppressors and determined to find a way off the station, Maru's like, look at all this food! Later, the women are introduced to Gul Dukat, who takes an immediate liking to Maru. He notices a scar she has from a time a Cardassian soldier assaulted her for not showing him respect. Instead of rejecting her as a comfort woman, Dukat asks for a medical device and erases the scar. 
he laments to Maru that there is a gulf between the Bajaran and Cardassian people, which is unfortunate. Still later, there's a party where the Cardassian officers and the women are getting to know each other a little better, and one of the Cardassians starts getting handsy with Maru. Dukat notices that Maru isn't having a good time, so he gallantly steps in and has Maru escorted back to her quarters, asking her to please not judge all Cardassians based on the boorish behavior of one man. The officer Kira's been hanging out with isn't impressed. He tells her Dukat has done this sort of thing before. It's all an act to win the trust of women he's sweet on. Of course it's all an act. This is Dukat we're talking about here. But it's effective. Dukat moves Maru into his quarters, and the next time Kira sees her, which isn't for a while, Maru seems healthy and happy, having settled into what appears to be domestic bliss with Dukat. Kira is less than pleased. She tells her mother, hey, I know he's treating you well right now, but don't forget that he took you away from your family and also that he's space Hitler. Maru's like, he's just misunderstood. The other day, he wrote a letter to the Cardassian Central Command that wasn't Hitlerish at all. He asked them to take another look at the enslave the Bajarans and steal all their resources policy and consider softening it somewhat. Kira's like, I can't believe this shit. A collaborator. My own mother. What did you say? Uh, my own mother, fucking best friend, or so I thought. But no, it turns out you're happy to play house with a guy whose job it is to murder our people. I am just not thrilled with any of this shit. Kira gets sent back to the Bajaran section of the station, where she's made friends with a member of the Resistance who asks for her help in assassinating Dukat. Her resistance contact gives her a bomb to plant in Dukat's quarters, so Kira pretends to want to apologize to Maru in order to get back in there. She makes up with Maru, Dukat's like, I'm glad to see you gals getting along again, and then retires to his study to do some Space Hitler stuff. Kira plants the bomb and is about to leave, knowing the blast will kill not only Dukat, but also her mother, when Maru plays a message she just received from Bajor, from Taban. Maru's husband, Kira's father. In the message, Taban tells Maru that the kids have been doing great since they moved back home from the refugee camp. The kids have asked for Maru, but Taban just tells them she's still back at the refugee camp. He thinks that's for the best. I miss you, Taban says. I think about you all the time. You've saved all our lives. Never forget that. I hope you can find some peace in your new life. No matter what happens, I love you, Maru. I'll always love you. Kira's like, God damn it! Oh, everybody out, there's a bomb! And they evacuate the cabin right before the bomb goes off, and then the orb brings Kira back to the future. Talking over the experience with Sisko a bit later, Kira says, I've always considered collaborators to be the absolute scum of the earth, and if I ever doubted it, I would think of my mother, who heroically gave her life for Bajor, unlike those traitors. But now I find out she was a collaborator this whole time. It's a kick in the teeth, I gotta tell you. She did what she had to do to save her family, including you, Sisko says. That doesn't make it right, Kira says. She goes on to say that she looked up her mother's records and found that she lived for seven years after meeting Dukat. Seven years. How many Bajarans died in the occupation during those seven years while she was living it up with Gul Dukat? But, Sisko asks, if that's how you feel, why did you save her from the bomb you planted? And Kira replies, part of me wishes I hadn't, but no matter what she did, she was still my mother. Lots of us have at least one problematic parent or grandparent or some other family member we're close to or friend we're close to. Granted, most of us, or <laughs> I hope most of us, don't have a loved one who is problematic in the collaborated with Nazis way, so we don't know exactly what Kira's going through, but we can at least relate Generally speaking, we know the same thing Kira knows, which is that relationships with our relatives and close friends can get, all together now, complicated. Kira's mother was a collaborator with the Cardassians, the mistress of the officer in charge of the occupation of her world, the officer responsible for the mass murder and enslavement of her people. Kira's family, including Kira herself, were able to escape the worst of the occupation as a side effect of her mother's collaboration. Both of those things are true. Kira herself is a terrorist and a murderer, 
and a freedom fighter, and a hero. All of those things are true. The good things do not cancel out the bad things, but neither do the bad things cancel out the good. If you find it difficult to hold all of those ideas in your head at once, if you find yourself unsure what to think or feel about Kira when confronted with her ugliest and most upstanding qualities at the same time, that's the point. That's what makes her complex, complicated, yes. That's what makes her something less than a perfect hero, but that's also what makes her something more. A great character. And if you're still not sure what to think of her, just ask MacGyver. He would know. He chooses his friends carefully. This was during Kira's blonde phase. Her blonde Canadian phase. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be, but before I do that, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are James Hodge. Thanks, James. Vincent Engler. Thanks, Vincent. Adam Winkleman. Thanks, Adam. Todd Ramsey. Thanks, Todd. Larry Bliss. Thanks, Larry. Nothings. Thanks, Nothings. David Brown. Thanks, David. Cameron Hunt. Thanks, Cameron. Raxacorico Fallopatorius. Thanks, Raxacorico Fallopatorius. Danon Tavana. Thanks, Danon. Nick Cooper. Thanks, Nick. Gedeon. Thanks, Gedeon. Gillis Parrish. Thanks, Gillis. Sergeant Flux. Thanks, Sergeant Flux. And now, for the new channel members. They are... Lynn Baker, thanks Lynn. Stardust, thanks Stardust. TG360 and beyond, thanks TG360 and beyond. Tiff Boggs, thanks Tiff. Skeptic Buffalo, thanks Skeptic Buffalo. Michael Chapman, thanks Michael. Michelle Greenmun, thanks Michelle. Chris Connett, thanks Chris. Meows at the Moon, thanks Meows at the Moon. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch along live stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. Now, for next month's regulation Trek Actually topic. Once again, I will focus on a specific character, and in fact, this is a character I've already done a video about, Seven of Nine. But that video focused on Seven's years on Star Trek Voyager. Now that Star Trek Picard has also completed its three-season run, there have been some developments with Seven's character. Some fans are pleased with these developments, some fans are very pleased and have been abjectly begging Paramount for more for like a year now. Other fans, not as pleased. I'll let you guess which camp I fall into after I tell you that next month's video will be titled Why Seven of Nine Actually Deserves Better. I'll just leave it at that for now, though. Keep you in suspense as to my feelings on the matter. That's next month. I'll be back then and a bunch of times before then. So until the next time you see me, whenever that is, Thanks for watching, and take care, everybody.